the Rhine to Isaac von Sinclair. Amid dark ivy, I was sitting at the forest gate. Just as a golden noon to visit the wellspring there came down from the steps of the alpine ranges, which, following ancient lore, I call the divinely built, the fortress of the heavenly. But where, determined in secret, much even now reaches men. From there, without surmise, I heard a destiny. For, debating now this, now that, in the warm shade, my soul had hardly begun to make for Italy and far away for the shores of Moria. But now within the mountains, deep down below the silvery summits and in the midst of gay verdure, where shuddering the forests and the heads of rocks overlapping looked down at him, all day there in the coldest chasm I heard the youth implore release. And full of pity his parents heard him rage there and accuse his mother Earth and the thunderer who fathered him. But mortals fled from the place, for dreadful, as without light he writhed within his fetters was the demigod's raving. The voice it was of the noblest of rivers of free-born rhyme, and different were his hopes when up there from his brothers Ticino and Rodanus he parted and longed to roam, and impatiently his regal soul drove him on towards Asia. Yet in the face of fate imprudent it is to wish. The sons of gods, though, are blindest of all. For human beings know their house and the animals where they must build, but in their inexperienced souls the defect of not knowing where was implanted. A mystery are those of pure origin, even song may hardly unveil it. For as you began, so you will remain. And much as need can affect in breeding, Still greater power adheres to your birth and the ray of light that meets the newborn infant. But where is anyone so happily born as the Rhine from such propitious heights and from so holy a womb to remain free his whole life long and alone fulfill his heart's desire like him? And that is why his word is a jubilant roar. Nor is he fond like other children of weeping and swaddling bands. For where the banks at first slink to his side, the crooked and greedily entwining him desire to educate and carefully tend the feckless within their teeth, he laughs, tears up the serpents and rushes off with his prey, and if in haste a greater one does not tame him but lets him grow, like lightning he must rend the earth, and like things enchanted the forest join his flight and collapsing the mountains. God, however, wishes to spare his sons a life so fleeting and smiles when, thus intemperate but restrained by holy alps, the rivers like this one rage at him in the depth. In such a forge, then, all that's pure is given shape. And it is good to see how then, after leaving the mountains, content with German lands, he calmly moves on and stills his longing and useful industry when he tills the land now Father Rhine and supports dear children in cities which he has founded. Yet never, never does he forget. For sooner the dwelling shall be destroyed, and all the laws and the day of men become iniquitous than such as he forget his origin and the pure voice of his youth. Who was the first to coarsen, corrupt the bonds of love, and turn them into ropes? Then, sure of their own rights and of the heavenly fire, defiant rebels mocked. Not till then, despising mortal ways, chose foolhardy arrogance and strove to become the equals of gods. But their own immortality suffices the gods. And if the heavenly have need of one thing, it is of heroes and human beings and other mortals. For since the most blessed in themselves feel nothing, another, if to say such a thing is permitted, must, I suppose, vicariously feel in the name of the gods, and him they need. But their rule is that he shall demolish his own house and curse like an enemy those dearest to him, and under the rubble shall bury his father and child, when one aspires to be like them, refusing to bear with inequality to fantastic. So, 
happy he who has found a well-allotted fate where still of his wanderings and sweetly of his afflictions the memory murmurs on banks that are sure so that this way that way with pleasure he looks as far as the bounds which god at birth assigned to him for his term and sight then blissfully humble he rests for all that he has wanted though heavenly of itself surrounds him uncompelled and smiles upon the bold one now that he's quiet of demigods now I think, and I must know these dear ones, because so often their lives move me and fill me with longing. But he whose soul like yours, Rousseau, ever strong and patient, became invincible, endowed with steadfast purpose and a sweet gift of hearing, of speaking, so that from holy profusion, like the wine god, foolishly, divinely, and lawlessly, he gives it away, the language of the purest, comprehensible to the good, but rightly strikes with blindness the irreverent, the profaning rabble. What shall I call that stranger? The sons of earth, like their mother, are all loving. So without effort, too, all things those blessed ones receive. And therefore it surprises and startles the mortal man when he considers the heaven which with loving arms he himself has heaped upon his shoulders and feels the burden of joy. Then often to him it seems best almost wholly forgotten to be, where the beam does not sear. In the forest shade by Lake Vienna amid foliage newly green, and blithely pour in tones like beginners to learn from nightingales. And glorious, then, it is to arise once more from holy sleep and awakening from coolness of the woods. At evening walk now toward the softer light, when he who built the mountains and drafted the paths of the rivers, having also smiling directed the busy lives of men so short of breath like sails and filled them with his breezes, reposes also. And down to his pupil, the master craftsman, finding more good than evil, day now inclines to the present earth. Then gods and mortals celebrate their nuptials, and all the living celebrate, and fate for a while is leveled out, suspended. And fugitives look for asylum, for sweet slumber the brave. But lovers are what always they were, at home, wherever flowers are glad of harmless fervor, and the spirit wafts around the darkling trees. But those unreconciled are changed, and hurry now to hold out their hands to the other before the benevolent light goes down and night comes. For some, however, this quickly passes. Others retain it longer. The eternal gods are full of life at all times. But until death, a mortal, too, can retain and bear in mind what is best and then is supremely favored. Yet each of us has his measure. For hard to bear is misfortune, but good fortune, harder. A wise man, though, is able from noon to midnight and on till morning lit up the sky to keep wide awake at the banquet. To you, in the heat of a path under fir trees, or within the oak forest's half-light wrapped in steel, my Sinclair God may appear. Or in clouds, you'll know him, since youthfully you know the good God's power. And never from you the smile of the ruler is hidden by day, when all that lives seems febrile and fettered. Or also by night, when all is mingled chaotically. And back again comes primeval confusion. <laughs>